are teams that have come and gone in Formula One that have had different, oh, what's the word, uh, statuses in the fandom, if that makes any sense. We sort of rate them high or low depending on how we feel about them because, well, this is social media and we need to tier list virtually everything, don't we? A tier, S tier, meme tier, people have different levels of regard for some of these teams. Some have been held in very high regard and have a cult following like Minardi. Some battled against all odds and operating on a minimal budget for so long like Tyrrell and for that reason, people respect them. And some have gone down as just footnotes even on dedicated sites like the now defunct F1 Reject site for how bad they were. Teams like Token, for instance. It's something in the region of about 48 teams that have gone bust over the time that Formula 1 has been running, 75 years or so, as it so happens. And one of the teams that met its sad demise in sort of the mid-2000s that was one of my personal favourites growing up was Jordan. Now I've covered a few elements of Jordan's history on the channel over the years. I've looked at their first car, the 191, I've covered the Michael Schumacher debut which was in a Jordan at Spa in 1991, I've covered their crowning glory, a 1-2 at the absolutely unhinged Belgian Grand Prix of 1998, Damon Hill's final year in 1999 where he decided he'd had enough, and how Jordan had been using a form of legal traction control that helped birth the second traction control era between 1999 and 2008. The plucky underdogs based in Silverstone did quite a bit, didn't they? But sticking with 1999, that's about as good as it got for Eddie Jordan's band of rock and roll underdogs, because once 1999 had been completed, a season where Heinz Harald Frensen got very close to winning the World Championship and Jordan might have done even better still in the Constructors if Damon Hill had been on the ball, it sort of fell off in dramatic fashion. The 1999 season was a close call. Heinz Harald Frentzen, one of the few shining lights on that cesspit that is Twitter, could have won the championship. If he'd won that hectic European Grand Prix, assuming results panned out the way they did for the rest of the season, he would have gone on to the Malaysian Grand Prix, the first of which happened in 1999, just three points behind Hakkinen in the standings. It's an absolutely mad season that could have gone differently still if the Michael hadn't been sidelined with a broken leg. So then, the 2000 season should have been full of promises. Damon was gone, but Jordan had hired Jano Trulli, the Italian showing a lot of promise in the years he'd been in the sport. He showed great qualifying pace, but had yet to show himself in a car that was half decent, and the Jordan that was turning up to the grid should have been an improvement on the lessons learned through 1999. Their best return of the season should have been in Monaco, where Trulli might have won the race, as he was ahead of race winner Coulthard until his gearbox went pop, and Frentzen was running in second until he clattered the wall at saint Devot. Frentzen would, however, score two podiums over the course of the season, one in Brazil and one at Indianapolis, but that was as good as it got. Trulli would get a fourth in Brazil with a smattering of six places in other races, but it was a case of being just on the bubble for Jordan that year. There's a few occasions where they were just outside of the points, as well as a lot of reliability issues to deal with. Jordan would slip down to six in the constructors as a result, but they also lost Mike Gascoigne, which didn't help things either. But there was one other thing happening in the background, and that concerns the team that was literally owned by a tobacco company instead of just being sponsored by one. British American Racing had a deal for their engines, which clashed with Jordan. Jordan, through 98, 99 and 2000, had been running Mugen Hondas, which aren't factory Honda engines. Honda as a factory engine supplier was back in 2000 after a spell away, teaming up with BAR. The mad Zip livery that had the 555 branding on one side and Lucky Strike branding on the other was gone, with Lucky Strike being the brand on display because, well, it's white and the logo that's on that white looks like a Japanese flag. Clever. Honda was supplying full-up factory support for BAR while Jordan had engines that weren't getting the same level of backing. As a result, in 2000, BAR finished ahead of Jordan, which must have left Eddie feeling a bit short-changed. Although Eddie would get proper Honda engines for 2001. It's one of those weird things. Mugen, which is the Japanese for infinite apparently, took Honda V10s and ran them as a separate company. I guess similar to, what, ABT to Audi, Cosworth to Ford, Ilmore to Mercedes, Callaway with Corvettes, and so on. Mugen was set up by Honda Sans Sun. Mugen Power roughly translates as unlimited power, but they had financial limits, something that Honda, once they came back, wouldn't have to deal with. And actually, that's something else that messed Jordan about as they approached 2001. By 2001, the manufacturers were heavily present in the sport. Ferrari is obviously Ferrari, Williams had BMW on board, Mercedes had shares in McLaren, Jaggy was the Ford factory team, Benetton had now been bought out by Renault, BAR was backed by Honda and like already mentioned was owned by a tobacco company, 
Toyota was 12 months away, Sauber was basically Ferrari's B team, and Prost went bust at the end of 2001. So now it was just Jordan, Minardi and Arrows that were the independents. The season was slightly better for Jordan in 2001. They were fifth in the constructors ahead of BAR, but they went the whole season without a podium. However, after the 11th round of the season, Frentzen left the team after reportedly having a fallout with EJ, but Eddie later admitted that the reason for dumping Frentzen was to appease Honda and bring in Takuma Sato. As would be a recurring theme for some of these privateers, it's often just business. If you remember the video on the 1998 Belgian Grand Prix, there's a segment in that race that even today has got people saying this, that, the other. There's that radio transmission where Damon says to the Jordan pit wall, look, if we race, we could end up with nothing. So it's down to Eddie as to what happens. So Eddie got on the phone to Sam Michael and Sam told Ralph not to overtake Damon. They got the one too. Now this has people claiming that Damon was saying, if he races me, I'm having us both off, or words to that effect. But Eddie had to see the bigger picture here. He had Mugen on his back for lack of results, and he had Benson and Hedges also demanding a return, because they were basically paying for Damon to be there, and they hadn't seen the 1996 champion do anything of note yet. Ralph's brother had already been involved in an accident with Coulthard. Half the field had been wiped out at the start of the race, and it was a case of, well, if Ralph tries to overtake Damon and overcooks the braking, or if Damon defends and blinds Ralph with the spray, we lose a 1-2. So we'll preserve it. I need results, and I need money. I don't give a f about feelings right now. So that's what Eddie did on this occasion. He got rid of Frentzen, brought in Sato. Engine suppliers were kept happy. It's probably not what Eddie wanted to do, but that's just the business of Formula One. Eddie still had Benson and Hedges sponsorship, but the net was closing in on tobacco company branding since more and more countries were now enacting bans on showing logos. Jordan would display Be On Edge when these bans were in place, and there was a drop in sponsor money too. And there was another sponsor thing going on, which is something that you see everywhere for some reason. 2002 was the year that DHL was on board with Jordan as a title sponsor. Now you see this thing on the internet all the time about how DHL rebranded to yellow and red because of Eddie Jordan and his team. But it runs a little bit more complicated than that. It's more a happy coincidence really. Deutsche Post had recently bought the San Francisco based parcel company with Deutsche Post having a yellow and black corporate scheme since the 1930s? When they bought out DHL, they rebranded the company to red and yellow, and since Jordans were yellow because of Benson and Hedges, Deutsche Post stuck their newly acquired asset on the side pods. The bit that everybody parrots on the internet is that originally the Jordan was supposed to be red and white, DHL's older colour scheme, until Eddie said, no, it needs to be yellow because of Benson and Hedges, can you change the logo? The Jordan cars certainly were great advertising for DHL since now they're, well, everywhere, but changing your entire brand image for one Formula 1 team? I can't see it. And I only say this because nowhere does DHL actually say anything about Formula 1. In fact, DHL's own website says, The DHL takeover by Deutsche Post resulted in the red DHL font being given a yellow background. The developers of the logo associated the yellow colour with a feeling of speed, which suits a logistics company. Also, due to the italic font, the figurative mark represents a stronger sense of movement. Like I said, happy coincidence. DHL is bought by Deutsche Post, which is yellow. Deutsche Post is sponsoring a team that has a yellow car because of another sponsor and wants to advertise its new purchase. So it says to Eddie, Hey, you've got a yellow car. We've got a yellow company. We've got this new acquisition that we need to plug. You've already got a yellow car. You don't have to do anything to it. Everybody's happy. You know how back in 1991, Eddie wanted the sort of green car to represent Ireland and he chased sponsorship from companies that had green well, corporate colour schemes. It's kind of like that, really. And there's a few videos on YouTube saying how a Formula One team changed this company's colour scheme and all that other stuff. And you read through the comments and some of them are going, oh, I didn't know this. But the vast majority of them are saying clickbait, 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 fake news, fake news, fake news. This is stupid. This is wrong. This is a myth, blah, 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 blah. But DHL doesn't mention Jordan at all. DHL mentions Deutsche Post. So, well, that's what I'm going to go with. Eddie probably does claim that, and I really do need to read his book at some point. It's just finding the time, but DHL saying it's to do with Deutsche Post, so that's what I'm rolling with.
For 2002, Fisichella was back at the team and he was partnered with Sato. The team scored a handful of points and did manage to beat BAR for the second time in a row. But as was the case with a couple of other teams that I've covered in these videos, keeping hold of decent engines was going to be hard, because BAR was going to be getting an exclusive supply from Honda for 2003 onwards. Arrows, like Prost, had also gone bust, meaning that it was now Jordan and Minardi propping up the end of the grid on shoestring budgets, although there was the added safety net of Toyota and Jaguar not doing much with their massive budgets. It meant that EJ was going to have to get something from somewhere. He ended up with a supply of Ford engines for 2003 and the sponsorship money was starting to teeter off. Benson and Hedges were still with the team but the Deutsche Post money was gone. The car looked a bit bare versus previous seasons, with a Chinese TV station being a logo on the car. But through sheer luck, Jordan would score one final victory. It's a video I've covered before so I won't keep you all day and actually Alamy has withdrawn the rights to the one picture that I had for this particular race. Basically, Fisichella was in the right place at the right time when Alonso crashed at the Brazilian Grand Prix. Weber crashed moments later and brought out a red flag. As Fisichella was leading the race on countback, the race was declared, although Raikkonen was initially declared the winner, with Fisichella collecting his winner's trophy just before the San Marino Grand Prix. It also means that only one of Jordan's wins came in the dry, the 1999 Italian Grand Prix. The point system changed that year, which was designed to help teams like Jordan and Minardi. Under the 2002 system, Fisichella's win would have been the only points they got all year, but he and Ralph Furman managed to get a combined three points over the rest of the season. Despite the win in Brazil, the only team they finished above was Minardi. Fisichella moved on to Sauber for 2004, but in the June of 2003, Eddie was in court because he was suing a major corporation. Eddie had made a claim with the High Court in London saying that the mobile phone service provider Vodafone had made a verbal agreement with him, only to pull out of that deal and then go and sponsor Ferrari instead. This was dragged through the courts for around six weeks, with the trial ending on the 29th of July 2003. Jordan claimed that over 100 million in sponsorship rested on four words, you've got the deal, which he claimed was said to him on the phone by Vodafone's branding director. But Vodafone said they were just in negotiations, negotiations that they also had with other teams as part of a global branding strategy, a global branding strategy that had already resulted in the sponsorship of the England cricket team and Manchester United Football Club. As the BBC reported at that time, just as Mr Justice Langley was about to hand down his judgement of the case, EJ did a U-turn and said he'd withdraw the claims and pay all of Vodafone's costs. Eddie was then blasted by the judge for blatant inaccuracies and when challenged on these was reduced to embarrassed silence. Needless to say, Eddie had to pay out a lot to cover the costs for Vodafone, something that the team never recovered from. Also in 2003, Minardi requested access to Bernie's Fighting Fund, a pot of cash that teams could get access to should they find themselves in the mud, either to get to the end of a season or otherwise keep them afloat while they search for a takeover or some other form of financial rescue, or to cover losses from a major sponsor pulling out, you know, that sort of thing. This was all set up by Bernie to try and help the struggling privateers. Prost had gone at the end of 2001. Arrows was done midway through 2002, which left 10 teams on the grid, for 2003 that is. If Minardi went, that's 18 cars on the grid. If Jordan went too, that's 16. If Sauber went as well, if Ferrari decided they didn't want to keep supplying them with parts and engines, that's 14 cars, and Formula 1 would look a bit silly. Eddie at this point was nosing around trying to get Mercedes engines, some of the most powerful engines available at that particular time. Because Mercedes had a share in McLaren, BMW had a share in Williams and other teams had manufacturer teams you know, straight up like Toyota or Renault or Jaguar, basically they wanted to continue spraying money up the wall and Minardi being around was stopping them from doing that because they were bringing in rules to try and protect Minardi. So if they could get rid of Minardi then it meant they could keep spraying money up the walls. So all the teams, including Eddie and Jordan, voted no. Eddie never got those Merck engines, by the way. <laughs> Jordan and Minardi were on life support by all accounts, but it's believed that despite this, Jordan had a workable budget. But that's it. It kept them there. Not much for development and certainly not enough to get them a car good enough to climb up the grid. For 2004, quick Nick Heidfeld was showing promise, but the car hadn't got the pace needed to get him over the line in a good spot. Giorgio Pantano was a pay driver brought in to help balance the books, but his sponsorship failed to materialise on a couple of occasions, and he missed the race in Montreal because of it. 
The only reason they scored points that year beyond the seventh place at Monaco was because the Toyotas and the Williams cars had been disqualified for brake irregularities, although the seventh place in Monaco would have been enough to keep them above Minardi in the championship. Then, in the latter part of 2004, it started to fall apart again. Ford was putting Cosworth up for sale, meaning that Jordan was going to be without engines for 2005. Toyota had agreed to supply engines to the team, the same as the ones in the factory cars as a bailout. But at a constructors meeting at Heathrow Airport, Bernie introduced Eddie to a Canadian businessman called Alex Schneider. Six weeks later, in the January of 2005, Eddie sold the team. It carried on as Jordan threw 2005, scoring its final podium at the farcical US Grand Prix, where it became Midland for 2006. It's funny to think then that Jordan was bought out by a Canadian billionaire and it goes through different hands and yada 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 and then it's bought out by another Canadian billionaire. Okay, it's not strictly the same team because of Racing Point losing all of their points in 2019, was it, or something like that, but it's still run out of that factory opposite Silverstone. So where did it all go wrong for Jordan then? Well, similar to the videos I did on Lotus and Brabham, some of it is to do with engines. McLaren in 1994 ran Peugeot engines and they kept blowing up. When those engines found their way into Jordans, they started getting the job done with them, until Prost came along and Peugeot was going to be the French supplier at the French team. So Jordan is left with Prost's old Mugens that were a bit iffy to start with and then started getting things on track with them as they win that Belgian Grand Prix and get close to winning a championship the following year. Only for BAR to arrive with Honda and Jordan beats BAR two years running. Honda works exclusively with BAR, leaving Jordan with Cozies that just can't cut it, and with sponsorship levels decreasing while the manufacturers with unlimited money could just spray money all over the place, there was no way of keeping up. It meant someone who was an old school privateer like EJ had no chance of making it to the front by, what, 2003, which explains the way the team dropped off the way it did around that time. The Vodafone fiasco probably didn't help either. Eddie had taken on Porsche and got a free car out of it. He'd got something out of Mercedes and Benetton when Schumacher left the team. He took Ralph for a few million. He'd done all this stuff, so when it came to taking on Vodafone, maybe he'd bitten off more than he could chew, and it slapped him in the face. But I don't think Eddie's ever spoken about it, as far as I can tell. Maybe it'll crop up on that podcast he does with David Coulthard. Eddie did say he took his eye off the ball around 2000, but what remains is that he gave us a rock and roll image with bright yellow cars, glamour models everywhere, and also a team that gave many drivers their break. Irvine, Barrichello, Schumacher, Zanardi, Sato. Andrea de Cesaris had his career rescued by Jordan because he was able to show that he was more than just a professional crasher. Then you've got Trulli, Fisichella and Heidfeld who used the team to showcase their abilities. I mean, Formula 1 is a bit worse off without people like Eddie Jordan, isn't it? There's no wheeler dealers anymore. You know, Eddie Jordan seems to be that sort of guy that goes into a pub and tells everybody about how his dad was involved in the great train robbery. You know, these tall tales. The way I like to describe Eddie Jordan is that he's a car salesman that ended up in Formula 1. Can you see where I'm coming from with that? I hope you do. So then, a look at the demise of one of the cult classic Formula 1 teams in Jordan. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more stuff from this channel, like, subscribe and get that bell on, as we're now about 600 away from the magical 100,000. Massive thanks as ever to the mad lads at Patreon that continue to support at a more personal level. And if you want to help contribute to the image buying fund and other bits and bobs, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials and other stuff. Or the super thanks and the membership stuff if you just want to do things that way. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. <music>